Welcome! In this video I'm going to be making a sea chest which is a chest about uh, two and a half feet uh, long by a foot and a half or so high and 20 inches or so deep that a retiring naval officer will use to keep uh, his uniform and his uh, insignia and, and so forth uh, you know commemorative chest so we're going to make it nice uh, and I've got some experience in that area. Those of you who've been following me know I was a naval officer, so I know exactly where my client's coming from. So uh, we're going to use white oak ebonized for the sides and the vertical dividers. And these pieces are going to be uh, over 14 inches high. And in order to get that kind of a uh, width, I'm going to have to uh, butt join a couple of pieces of, uh, of, of uh, white oak. And I would like to uh, book match if I can. The thickest pieces are 13 sixteenths. Uh, the rest of the pieces are 5 eighths or 1 half. Uh, so I've got some 8 fourths lumber here that I milled a couple years ago. This uh, wood actually came off of my property. And it's been uh, through the kiln and in storage down in my uh, wood storeroom. Uh, for, like I say, a couple of years. Okay, so I spent some time with my drawing and these boards and I've gone ahead and marked them up. I can get a front piece out of this, one of the inside vertical pieces, the back out of this, another inside vertical piece, both sides down here, and the rest of these are more interior vertical pieces. <laughs> I know you couldn't see that, but if you were able to look at this line, I pretty much split the line the entire way down. And I learned how to do that from Michael Fortune, who's pretty good with a bandsaw. And I may have explained this in past videos, but he taught us to use the back of the blade as a guide. So as I'm, as I'm feeding the wood through the blade, I've got just a slight sideways, kind of a little bit of a twist to it, so that I know that I'm bearing on the back of the blade with my wood and that way I could just make just slight little changes to keep the, the blade right on the on the line. set my uh, guide up here nice and high, about a half inch above the wood, fence is all set, and we're ready to go. The key to resawing is patience. It's a slow process. Someone was touring my shop yesterday and asked why I only had a 14 inch bandsaw. I said, well it does everything I need to do. It does the resawing and so forth. I use a regular half inch, three tooth per inch blade. It's uh, carbon steel. Um, I've tried the real hard tip blades and so forth. I don't find that they work any better or last any longer in the work I do. So I stick with this and it works. Okay, all the planks are resawn. Uh, I'm going to let these sit for several days, and uh, you know when you resaw wood, you release all the internal tensions, and it gets a little springy. So I'm trying to convince it to uh, settle out, settle out the way I want it, using a few little helpers here. It's Christmas Eve. I'm going to turn in for the for the night. Go we'll get some dinner. Go to church, and I'll see you in a few days. I've let these boards sit for about. Uh, six days and uh, then I ran them over the jointer and through the planer to get them flat again and thickness and now I'm going to butt glue this uh, book match pair so I have one pair here I think this is the uh, the back and the first thing I do is uh, make sure I got the book match right and then I'm just going to draw a big V on here to tell me uh, where the matching face is. 
and then now I'm going to go over to the jointer and we're going to joint these edges to get them to line up. Now the jointer fence is never going to be perfectly uh, at 90 degrees and so what I'll do is I'll run one of these boards with the face away from the fence I'll run the other board with the face at the fence and that way any difference from 90 degrees uh, of the fence angle complements and the pieces will fit together nice and flat across the plane. see it but I have a good square line up here but with any plane or a jointer you usually get just a little bit of snipe on the uh, ends uh, so I'm going to go ahead and use the hand plane just to smooth these out try to make them as perfect as I can to get the best joint I can okay I've got a 50 degree uh, bevel in this low angle plane and I'm just going to just take off just a, just a hair. Like I say, I'm not trying to change much except just to get these pieces to fit together perfectly. It looks like we have a nice tight joint, so we can go ahead and do the glue up now. By the way, one of the things I didn't video was that after I trued up the mating edge, I ripped the other edge to make sure it's perpendicular to the face of the board. So when the clamps apply pressure, they're applying pressure directly along the axis that I, that I need the pressure. If, if you don't true up that, that edge, it's along the clamp. The clamp's going to have a tendency to want to make the board lift up. Okay, so. Go ahead and put some glue. I'm just doing a butt joint, which uh, butt joints are, if done correctly, are at least as strong as the wood itself. Okay, using my lines to show the V that I put on there, if you recall, make sure I get these lined up properly. And I set these on a couple of blocks that I've put packing tape on to prevent the glue from sticking. And that keeps this off off the bench so that I can easily clamp. Because no matter what, clamps have a tendency just to bow a little bit, which like I was saying, you know, you want your perpendicularity of the pressure, so that's why I use some clamps in the opposite direction to counteract, to counteract that tendency. The book match panels for the front, back, sides, and interior dividers are all glued up, and now it's time to thickness them. The front and the back are supposed to be about 13 16 and the sides and everything else about 5 8 uh, now I could use a planer and a, a you know jointer and a planer to try to level the boards and thickness them, but because I've got a glue line in there, there is a tendency to chip my knives a little bit. I use high-speed steel knives, and I don't want to do that and have to replace knives. And uh, it, it, there's always a chance of uh, of tear up, so I'm just going to use 60 grit uh, sandpaper in my drum sander and uh, flatten them nice and gently and, and uh, we'll be all done. Now I'm going to square up the edges of the, uh, the white oak pieces. I used the jointer to joint a nice true edge and now I'm going to use this uh, cross-cut sled 
which is very precise to uh, square up the, the other edges. Okay, I've trimmed up all the pieces and uh, I've laid them out on edge instead of the true orientation they should be because I'm trying to make sure that I have the total width of all the assembled pieces correct. I was shooting for a sixteenth of an inch of reveal between the side and the edge. I've got a little less than that. Probably a thirty second is more like what I really want. So I'm just going to shave a little bit off of this middle spacer and that will bring it all together. I want it to be perfect before I set lines for, for doing the, uh, the doweling. And now with the lineup just like I want it, I'm going to go ahead and score a little line with my knife. And that way I know exactly where these pieces are meant to be. Now I think the best way to assemble this piece is going to be using screws. Um, and I don't want the screws to be uh, you know, bit visible. The client doesn't want them visible either. Uh, so I'm, I'm cutting plugs that I can plug the holes with. I'm using a plug cutter. It's a tapered plug cutter. So it makes plugs that are tapered. I'm drilling down into some of my waste, you know, scrap from the wood. And, uh, and then I'll bandsaw all the plugs out and we'll see how they fit. And if I'm necessary, I'll do a little bit of adjustment on the depth because the deeper you go, the, uh, the smaller the diameter of the plug. And the goal is to make uh, you know several dozen of these plugs that I can then plug the holes and uh, clean them up and ebonize them and finish them and make it not too noticeable. drill the holes for the plugs to go into and screw heads followed by the shank hole. Okay, if you've been following my uh, videos up to this point, uh, you may be saying this is getting kind of boring. He's doing the same things all over again. Well, this is new right now, so pay attention. I'm figuring out how to make the cutouts on the front. So I brought up the 3D model of just the pieces that you've already seen. I've separated out the just the front into a 2D model so that I'd have the vectors, which I then imported as a DXF file into vCarve Pro. I'm going to use the ShopBot to cut out these openings and make them very precise. Not only that, but I'll have the ShopBot make the rabbits for the glass. So here's the 2D vectors in vCarve Pro. I then went and made the tiling, or excuse me, the, uh, the, the tool path to, to make the cuts. And uh, I think I can bring them up right here. You can see the cuts there. So because the bed on my shop bot is only 18 inches high and this piece is 32 inches high, I'm going to cut it in two tiled sections. A lower section and then an upper section. And what I'll do is I'll actually move the work and reposition it between tilings. So let me show you about how that's going to work. Bring up the tile excuse me, bring up the tile manager to show the tile tool paths and we'll reset uh, the 3D into 2D and you can see this line shows that down here is the first tile they call T1 and then I'll change to T2 show you what that looks like and that's up here so basically I'll cut this then I'll unscrew this piece move it on down the table realign it and let it cut the top part. So you can see on 
the previews what that's going to look like. We'll preview T1 and it cuts like that. Then I'll shift the work 16 inches and then we'll cut the rest. And that ought to make it really accurate and really easy to, to do. Now I want to be able to line up the work perfectly in the uh, along the y-axis. So I've attached a fence uh, and I've overlapped the fence a little bit uh, past the zero point and I'm going to true up the fence using a quarter inch uh, uh, end mill in the shop bot. So if the shop bot thinks that that way is straight, that's what the fence will end up being and we'll end up with a good result. The next thing I'm going to do is get the machine to tell me exactly where it thinks 16 inches is on this fence. So I simply made a little mark at the 16 point and I'll be all set. Now since I want to really make sure I got this right, I'm going to do an air cut, that is no work in there, just let the bit trace the pattern in the air, make sure that everything's right on. And here we go, the moment of truth. I did a successful air cut, everything measured out okay, I let the bit cut a little bit into the spoil board so I could get good measurements, and uh, now I've, I've screwed the piece down using the holes that I made for uh, the assembly phase and uh, bits in, Z axis zeroed, XY zeroed, we're ready to go. shifted my wood. I did not have to reset the Z0 or the XY0 because it's the same piece of wood. And screwed it all down, got my new file in here, tile number two, and we're ready to go. Using the computer aided design model that I use to design my work, along with Vetrix VCarve Pro, which has this tiling function, I was able to do what would normally be a very difficult operation making all these cutouts and making them exact. Now, when I ebonized this white oak, I really, what we're doing is dyeing it black, maybe with a hint of brown in it, but it's an aniline dye which is water based. And so that's going to raise the grain on this oak like crazy. So what you need to do is you need to first soak it with a little bit of water, get the grain to raise up, and then sand off those high spots. So I've sanded this all down to 220 grit. I'm going to raise the grain. I've already sprayed some water on here and wiped it off. And boy, you can feel the difference. It's like it never got sanded. Then I, once it's dry, I'll shave off all those fibers, uh, starting with 220, move up to probably 320, and, uh, and then we'll be ready to dye. And when we dye, uh, we won't get as much raising of the grain. So I just spray the water on. And then I rub it on. And Get in there good and then go go and wipe off the excess. Don't want it being sloppy. And this will dry out pretty quick, especially this time of year. It's winter with the heat on. 
relative humidity in here is probably down around 35 to 40 percent. And so it won't take long. And that's it. That's raising the grain. Let it dry on both sides so you don't get any cupping of the wood. When I cut this face piece on the shop bot, I used a quarter inch bit so it left a, a radius on the inside of all these corners. And that's, that's actually good for all the, the pockets that have glass in them. But for the two drawer pockets, we really need square uh, openings. So I'm using a corner chisel and a, a regular bench chisel just to square off these corners. Doesn't take much to, to do that. There you go. I'm making the thin strips that are going to hold the glass into the main case for uh, where the, the three openings are. And so I've taken on a piece of oak. Uh, I thickness it down to 3 16 inches, which is what I need. And uh, now I'm going to rip these to 3 8 inch wide. Now that's really narrow, so I found a safe way to do that is to take a piece, uh, in this case a little particle board, cut a little notch on it, on it so that you can hook behind your, your, your work. Go ahead and joint the edge so that it's nice and straight. And then you can run this through like this and you keep your fingers safely away from the blade and yet you're holding the piece down very, very nicely. I'm now drilling the holes to assemble the various parts and these are parts of the center partitions. Now, it's important that the pieces are nice and flat once they're in place and, and nice and perpendicular to each other. And so I've made a little jig here where I have a, a piece of maple that I've uh, surfaced all four sides nice and square. I lay that along the line that I scribed on the other side that shows the edge of this divider piece. And then I clamp this divider piece, well I clamp the, the pieces to this, basically all, both pieces to this so that they come in nice and square flush exactly where they're supposed to be and then I just come in with a drill and drill out the pilot hole. Now I'm doing a dry assembly of the entire box. I want to get everything to fit right before I start doing finishing. Well, I've got the case all dry screwed together. I've also attached the bottom. Uh, again, dry screwed. And now I'm setting the hinges for the top. I've got these really nice solid brass uh, hinges. Uh, and I'm going to, they're two and a half inch long. I'll make it a five eighths inch deep uh, mortise. And to, to do that the easy way, I'm using my little, uh, you know, quarter inch router, which I can hand hold. And I can get most of the meat carved away, but more importantly, I can get the bottom the right depth, which is, just makes it a whole lot easier to set the hinge. Okay, and then all I got to do is come back with a chisel and just cut up to the line, pair off this little part in the middle that you know I needed to keep for support. The way I cut off these plugs that I put into the screw holes is to use a, a saw that I got from uh, Lee Valley and it's uh, got teeth that are set only on one side so this saw says this side up meaning uh, the teeth are all set in that direction if you run your fingers across the back you don't feel much set but you do across the front I've got a couple of these my first is a single sided and then later on I got the double sided but the way you do it you just slightly bend 
the saw so that the blade stays flat to the work. Make sure you have the, this side up on the outside. And you gently saw off the protruding plug. <laughs> 